Okay, well, Mark's in the building. That's good to see you all. Uh, Jack, if you can turn this microphone up. Testing one, two, testing one, two. A little bit more, a little bit more. Okay, can you hear me okay? Because I can talk without it, that's for sure. Okay, what, what I want to do is I want to welcome you and I want to welcome those watching from home. Thank you for braving this wonderful weather today to come to worship in presence. And of course, we thank those that tuned on and tuned in. Uh, we do always appreciate that as well. Uh, now, um, one little housekeeping chore and then we'll get to the fun part. The, the housekeeping chore is we're looking for someone who might be interested in doing custodial work for our church. Those of you at home, we're looking for a part-time custodian, a man or woman, doesn't have to be a member of our church. Um, if you are, that's great. If you aren't, that's fine as well. It's twelve fifty an hour, and we estimate somewhere in the nature of six to eight hours a week. Now, we had a team of people that volunteered to do the building for years. As a matter of fact, probably as long as the church has been around. But unfortunately, the pandemic has put a lot more pressure on all of us, and we realize that we need some more specialized care. So if you know of somebody that might be interested or you feel would be qualified, and they could help you know they could they could they could use the money and those of you at home the same deal if you know of somebody tell them there are job descriptions on the communion table pick one up as you leave I can make more those of you at home or watching at whatever convenience you're watching you email me send me a text give me a call and we'll make sure that we get you the information so that you can make an intelligent decision our goal is to have that individual on site by March and so this is February so we're we're diligent about this and we're very serious about this as well okay now today I want us to talk about the character of God and we're gonna do that through our music and so of course the very first quality is this wonderful God we celebrate he gets all the glory and that's where we're gonna start with hymn number 56 if you have access to the hymnal to God be the glory and if you're able to stand with me here in the building please stand we're gonna sing the first and the third stanza to God be the glory great things he hath done so loved he the world that he gave us his son who yielded his life an atonement for sin and opened the life gate that all may go in praise the Lord praise the Lord let the earth hear his voice praise the Lord praise the Lord let the people rejoice so come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory. Great things he hath done. Great things he hath taught us. Great things he hath done. And great are rejoicing through Jesus the Son. But purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Pray with me. Father, we give you the glory. We thank you for the privilege of being here or watching at home or wherever we are at as we have a time just to spend it in your presence with the body of Christ reflecting upon your grandeur, your glory, your greatness. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you do and what you provide in our lives. Now, right now, as we continue to worship you, may we do so in a spirit of truth and realize that ultimately everything we know about you, everything we have about you, you've told us, and we trust that it's accurate. And we give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Now, one of the things I'm going to talk about uh, later in the message is one, one of the I think very valuable things that I would encourage you to do is to consider to examine some of the biographies of the great men and women of God. We would call it, you know, reading about the saints. And I use that more in a technical term because technically everyone here is a saint. If you're a Jesus Christ follower, you are a saint. But sometimes the church has set a certain segment of people aside and said, well, they're super Christians. So we'll talk about super Christians. But some of those individuals are amazing. And I always encourage you to look and to examine their lives. One such amazing person was the author of uh, that last song. Her name was Fanny Crosby. 
Fanny Crosby was an amazing hymnist, and, and one of the things that I think just stands out in my mind is she was blind. As a matter of fact, one individual was talking about her and described her this way. She is a blind lady whose heart can see splendidly in the sunshine of God's love. I mean, she had a relationship with God that was amazing, and of course, much of her music reflects that grand love for God. So, to God be the glory. Now, we're going to continue to talk about God and this and what He is, and we're going to sing, O Worship the King. It's hymn number 104, and we're going to sing the first, the second, and the fifth stanza. This is a great hymn. Oh, worship the King, all glorious above, and gratefully sing His wonderful love. Our shield and defender, the Ancient of Days, pavilioned in splendor and girded with praise. Oh, tell of His might and sing of His grace, whose robe is the Light, whose canopy space, his chariots of wrath, the deep thunder clouds form, and dark is his path on the wings of the storm. All hail to the King in splendor enthroned, glad praises we bring, thy wonders make known, returning victorious, great conquest of sin, King Jesus, our glorious, our victory will win. Now, when I was growing up, like many of you, I grew up in the church. And I have to be honest, as, as a kid, you know, coming to church every Lord's Day, um, there were parts of the worship service that I loved, and there were parts of the worship service that I didn't love as much. For example, and this is ironic, I hated the sermon. <laughs> Oh, I thought it was so boring to listen to some guy talk about stuff. Just get to the good stuff. For me, the good stuff was the music. You can tell me the truth, Marilyn. That's always been your favorite too, right? Okay. You know, the music is amazing. And of course, again, I'm talking as a child. I still have a little junior high boy in me. I'm talking as a child. I always loved those up-tempo, fast, good, you know, great songs like We're Marching to Zion or All Fly Away or, you know, We All Get to Have. I love that music. Up-tempo, good, great message. And let me tell you, those songs are still wonderful to sing today. But as I've gotten older, I realized that some of the really amazing music was the music that as a child, the hymns as a child, that I just wasn't as attracted to because they were a little bit more somber they addressed maybe a little bit more of a serious issue. And so if I was to be completely honest, as a kid, singing the rest of the music this morning, I would have probably not given it a good grade because we're going to change gears a little bit and we're going to go just a little bit more serious, a little bit more somber, because I want us to think about not just, you know, what God is as king and what he is and what we should bring to him as glory, but some of the other parts of his, of, of his character. And this song has been around for a long, long time. Um, I can't say it's my favorite, but I, I have grown to appreciate it and love it. And we know it as This Is My Father's World. It's hymn number 143 if you have access to a hymnal. And we're going to sing the first and third stanza, the words on the screen, as we worship our God. This is my Father's world, and to my listening ears, all nature sings, and round me rings the music of the spheres. This is my Father's world, I rest me in the thought of rocks and trees, of skies and seas, His hand the wonders wrought. This is my Father's world. Oh, let me ne'er forget that though the wrong seems off so strong, God is the ruler yet. This is my Father's world. 
the battle is not done. Jesus who died shall be satisfied and earth and heavens ring. That uh, third stanza, that second line, that though the wrong seems off so strong, God is the ruler. Yeah, that's a great line. Um, the next hymn, if I was confessing, this is probably one of my least favorite songs as a child growing up. We didn't sing it often, but we did sing it occasionally. And now historically, I didn't realize how important this particular hymn was in, in the direction the church took. As a matter of fact, this, is often, this song is often credited for the Reformation movement, the whole beginning of uh, the Protestant movement within the Christian faith. And of course, if I give you another hint, you'll probably remember this song yourself. This was written by of none other than Martin Luther, who wasn't just a great theologian, but he was also a great hymnist. He, he wrote several songs, but this song is the song. Now as an adult, I have a greater appreciation for its significance, for its richness, for its beauty. We know it as a mighty fortress is our God, and it's hymn number 151, and again, it's not a song that we sing a lot of, but this is a song that has some great theology in it. So join in as we sing the first and the second stanza. Almighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper, he amid the flood of mortal hills prevailing. For still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great and armed with cruel hate. On earth is not his equal. Did we in our own strength confide, our striving would be losing. Were not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing? Dost ask who that may be? Christ Jesus, it is he. Lord Sabaoth, his name, from age to age the same, and he must win the battle. Now, as a kid, that wasn't a very hit song. As an adult, that has some amazing theology in it. And I just draw your attention to that, that one line he says. Uh, it's the second stanza, the entire second stanza I always find amazing. Did we in our own strength confide our striving would be losing? We're not the right man on our side. Who is that right man? The man of God's own choosing. Dost ask who may that be? Well, Christ Jesus, it is he. Lord Sabaoth by name, the Lord of the Sabbath, from age to age the same, and he must win the battle. Again, it's not... It's not something a kid goes out saying, ooh, that's a great tune, but it has got some great meat to it. The, the a mighty fortress is our God. Well, the last praise hymn that we're going to sing is another one of those significant songs that um, has marked the church. Uh, it was actually called a crusader's hymn, even though by all indication it was written years after the crusades. It is a song about... Well, about God's dependability. It's based on the prophet Jeremiah as he witnessed, I mean, he had a front row seat as the city of Jerusalem was being destroyed by God's enemies, and he is lamenting, lamenting over that destruction. So hence the book Lamentations. But in the middle of that book, he strikes a chord that we can identify with. No matter how Difficult circumstances may see, whether it's health, maybe, whether it's pandemic, whether it's cultural, whether it's political, whatever it might be, God's faithfulness is great. 
And that's the hymn, hymn number 139, Great is Thy Faithfulness. And we're going to sing just the first two stanzas. So we've, we've talked about the glory of God. We've talked about his position as king, as ruler. We've reminded ourselves that he's the creator, the sustainer of life. This is, after all, our Father's world. And then we just kind of came across and were reminded, as Martin Luther had written you know, several hundreds of years ago, that no matter what happens, we have a mighty fortress, and that fortress is our God, and he has a plan for our life. And then finally, we're just reminded of his faithfulness, his steadfastness, his dependability. God, great is thy faithfulness. Oh, that's amazing. Thank you, Marilyn. Um, I draw your attention in your program. You'll notice there is some prayer information. It's on the back page of your program if you picked one up. For those of you at home, I hope you have access to our email that we send out. Uh, we try to send that out on Saturday. And if you don't receive it and you would like to, just let us know. Give us a, some information, a shout out. Send a message, text, call the church office, leave that message. And we'll be glad to include that on our email list. But in the prayer list, there are a lot of names, a lot of information. Um, I'm not going to go over all of it again, but I do want to draw your attention all the way down to the bottom of the list. I did talk to Karen last night, and Neil is home, and he has got some more tests to determine what the exact problem is. They're, they have several possibilities, but uh, keep Karen and Neil in your prayers. The name below, below that is a, a child. This is a friend of uh, my wife and I and Emerson. Uh, it's a little girl, and she has uh, got some serious heart problems. She was born that way, and so now they're talking about putting her on the transplant list, and that's got all kinds of complications to it as well. So keep this young life. Her, her mom, Abby, and, uh, and her father, just uh, keep them in your prayers as well, Derek. Um, now, to add to the prayer list, if you've got a pen or pencil, and I'm just going to give you first names. We'll have more information next week, but keep Jeff in your prayers, Jeff and Jaina. Jeff had surgery on his knee, had a partial knee replacement Friday, uh, he's doing quite well. Uh, he's, according to Jaina, she said he is resting a lot, which is good, and he seems to have moderate pain. So keep Jeff in your prayers, and keep Jeff in your prayers, because Jaina is his caregiver, and I hope she's watching. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> the second one I want you to write down is Carol. Judy and Tom come to our church, and Carol is uh, Judy's sister. Carol has been diagnosed with some complications. I, I think it's, it's, it's MS. Uh, no, it's not. My wife's shaking. What is it? Oh, ALS. Thank you. Ooh, that is different. ALS. It's a devastating disease. Uh, keep Carol in your prayer. She was in the hospital. Of course, in the hospital right now, she's isolated. Can't be seen by anyone, but I do know that her husband, Fred, was able to sneak in and see her yesterday. But just keep Carol in your prayers. Um, the next one I want you to write down is Debbie. Uh, this is Jim's cousin. Uh, she has got Crohn's disease, and then she got cancer, and then all kinds of complications as a result of that, and they're really concerned about her, her situation. So keep Debbie in your prayers. And with Debbie, a friend of the families of Jim and Maggie's, his name is Jim. Uh, we were talking about before service, somewhere in his 40s, we're not quite sure, he's got family, uh, had moved to Texas and kind of got settled in, and then all of a sudden, double vision set in, and then he's... His, one side of his body was, was not working. They suspected a stroke, and one thing led to another, and they haven't ruled out, or they've ruled out a stroke, but they haven't ruled out a lot of other things. He may have MS. He may have some other complications. Just keep that gym in your prayers. Now, if you have someone that we should be praying for, there are prayer forms available in the building, and those of you watching, uh, send us a text, an email, whatever, and we'll be honored to include uh, whomever you know that we should be praying for. We, we take prayer seriously, uh, and we try to honor your request. Now, I, again, I say this because you give us that information. We print it, and it becomes kind of public. We don't try not, I try not to pronounce their names, the full names online or anything, but we do print and publish that information in our details like our program and whatnot. And so if you give us that information, make sure that it's okay for us to publicly announce that kind of material because we do want to respect an individual's privacy when it comes to medical concerns, okay? So we're going to talk to God. Pray with me. Father, it is an awesome privilege to know that we can talk to the God who created and sustains life. And though it doesn't always turn the way we want it to be, life has a unique way of Sometimes, as the statement is, it throws a wrench in the works. We still know that you're in control. 
And so we lay at your feet these names that are precious to us. I, I didn't mention David, but uh, there's great news as the cancer is receding. That's fantastic. No sign of it now. We have other victories because celebrations because of the power of God, of your grandeur, of what you do, of your healing ability. And of course, the power of prayer. And, but then we have these, these little lives like Emerson who is struggling to stay alive. And her mom and dad are pleading with you as we are to sustain and to continue that life. Uh, it's, it's been heavy on my heart, that this expression that so often we cannot see your hand. Help us to trust your heart. Help us to trust that you do know what's best in the life of every person we've mentioned and, and every person who's watching and listening to what we're talking about today. We just give you the glory. We thank you. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's try this. How's it sound? Good? Thank you, Jack. Yeah, that's good. Um, <clears throat> inside your program, if you want to track some information for our prayer time, I mean our, our the message time, you can do that. It's there. Um, I came across, and, and you've seen these things before, I came across a study that was done by the London Times. They apparently apparently interviewed like 3,000 plus American citizens, and they were asking them the question, identify your greatest fear. Identify your greatest fear. And, and some of these you, you would suspect is, is the truth. I mean, for example, 8% of the people responding said they're scared to death of the darkness. They don't like the dark. 19%, uh, almost 2 out of every 10, they are afraid of dying and death. I, I can understand that. 22% said they're, they're concerned about financial collapse. 22% said they were afraid of insects. Um, just a real quick poll, how many people hate spiders? How many spider haters in the building? Thank you, I see those hands. 32% um, said they were afraid of heights, tall ladders, that kind of stuff. And 41%, four out of every 10 said they were afraid. This is the highest statistic, they were afraid of public speaking. Now, I find that interesting. <laughs> I can understand that. Well, I find it interesting because that means more people would rather be in the coffin than the person giving the eulogy at the funeral. <laughs> I just, as a minister, I, I find that intriguing. You know, we're all afraid of something. Um, I'm afraid of the dark. And please, don't ask Lola after service about the closet because the closet still bugs me. Just... Leave it alone. Uh, I remember George. George was talking about his, his, his wife, Shirley, uh, when they were uh, much younger and, and just starting out life together. Uh, they had in their house, they had that uh, 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 fuel oil kind of a furnace, and so they had these 55-gallon drums in the backyard, and they stood almost six feet tall from the ground to the top. And Shirley, if you remember, she was a petite little thing. Uh, but she was deathly afraid of snakes. And on one occasion, a snake in the backyard crawled across her foot, and George said she literally jumped from the ground to the top of this 55-gallon drum of fuel. She didn't climb. She jumped. <laughs> Fear makes us do some irrational things and some amazing things. Um, I attended a conference for preachers in Indianapolis several years ago, and the keynote speaker, he said, my wife was petrified of car accidents. You know, I'm, I'm not making fun of that. That's a serious problem. You don't want to have a car accident. She was terrified that she, I mean, she would get in the car and she'd strap herself in, and, you know, she'd adjust all the mirrors, and those are good habits, folks. I'm not making fun of it. You know, two and ten, two and ten. I mean, she was a serious driver. She was scared to death of being in a car accident. So he came up with this idea. <clears throat> he decided, well, you know what, just going to have a little fun with my wife. They were going on a journey, a trip, and it was in the evening, and she fell asleep. And so he pulled into a truck stop, and he found this big semi with its lights on, and he pulled right up in front of it, <laughs> and he screamed. <laughs> and guess what? He discovered his greatest fear, divorce lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking, don't do that. That is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Uh, fear, and you know this, fear is actually, it helps us to escape danger. It's got some biological things. It's part of our God-given survival mechanism. Uh, when we experience fear, our adrenal glands pump in, a, and they're, they're located above the kidneys, they, they pump in, you know, quantities of adrenaline into the bloodstream, and that enables 
us to have certain biological reactions in our body. For example, it increases blood and oxygen to our muscle tissue so that we can run faster or we can fight. It restricts the blood flow to other parts of the body, like the stomach, in case you get an injury. And it dilates our pupils so that we're able to see better, maybe in the night, maybe not. Uh, fear has its advantages. It's, it's a part of what we know as the flight or fight syndrome. And in this sense, in this state, our senses and reflexes become heightened, and it's easy for us to escape real and sometimes not so real danger. Now, we've been in a sermon series called Imponderables. And uh, actually, the idea came because of David Feldman. He wrote like 11 books with that, this title, and he has all these crazy questions he asks, questions that just kind of make you go, hmm, like, do penguins have knees? And, you know, all kinds of other ridiculous things, and some of them are just fascinating. We have a few in our church library if you want to take one home. But uh, I thought, let's, let's use that, and let's ask some questions that make us go, hmm. And today we're going to talk about fear. Now, fear is a big moneymaker. It is a huge moneymaker. Do you guys remember 20 years ago when the fear factor was on television? Did anybody watch it? I mean, that's where they would have people eat bugs and lie in boxes with snakes crawling on. In other words, they would find your fear and then they would capitalize on that fear and they would see just how far you could go as you competed against other contestants to win thousands of dollars. Well, it's, it's set in motion a whole bunch of stuff because we're becoming, uh, we're becoming fear junkies. Uh, there's a show on today, I, I don't recommend it. I, I've caught just a few of the, the bare facts. It's naked and afraid. And I, I tell you what, that doesn't appeal to me at all, being in the jungle completely without clothes. Not, not fun at all. But, and I know some of you are some real thrill seekers because you, you root for the Chicago Cubs, but that's another problem we won't talk about. <laughs> but it's major money. It's big money. I mean, you know, roller coasters are getting bigger and badder and faster, and they drop further, and all kinds of amazing things. And of course, I haven't even talked about the movie industry and all the stuff that goes on in making the horror movie, the, the sci fi thriller. I mean, we are addicted to on the edge, on the edge of your seat kinds of things. But today I want to talk about fear. Not fear in the sense of something dreadful, but fear in the sense of something wonderful. Because as the title of the sermon kind of recommends, everything good in life does start, does begin with fear. The fear of the Lord. Do you want wisdom, the Bible says? Then fear the Lord. The beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. Do you want to lengthen your life? The Bible says, then fear the Lord. Do you want God's provision? Then fear the Lord. Do you want God's blessing? Then fear the Lord. Do you want to know the love of God? Then fear the Lord. Do you want God to be pleased with your life and with your activity? Then fear the Lord. Do you want to learn to fear nothing else and no one else? Then fear the Lord. And to parents and grandparents, the Scripture says, do you want your children, do you want your grandchildren to be safe and live long? Teach them to fear the Lord. Now, who says that? Well, according to the Scriptures, everybody says that. God says that. Moses says that. Abraham says that. The prophets in the Old Testament say that. The apostles say that. Jesus said that. We see that at Moses at the burning bush when he was standing before God or actually kneeling before God in terror. We see Pharaoh when the plagues begin to fall and that he vacillated between the fear of God and his own stubborn heart. We see uh, Isaiah in the temple as he saw the glory of God. And the disciples in the presence of Jesus, they had a roller coaster emotional experience with him all the time. I mean, they were constantly, it, it, it constantly says they were terrified. They feared the Lord. When, when he walked on the water, remember that was late at night and they were in the boat and they see Jesus walking across the top of the waves and there's a storm about and it just petrified them. And then on another occasion when he collected a great catch of fish and he brought it to the shore, they were terrified. When he, when he restored life, they were terrified. When he cast out demons, the disciples were terrified. They constantly were scared of what was going on. One of my uh, favorite stories in that genre uh, is when Jesus took Peter, James, and John. Now, you, you guys remember this. I mean, there were 12 apostles 
But within the 12 apostles, there was a core that were really close to Jesus. That was Peter, James, and John. And they seemed to go with him into some unique places, some, some unique circumstances. On one of those occasions, in a unique circumstance, he takes those three guys up on top of a hill with him. And then all of a sudden, there's this, this, this the, well, the Bible says his face shone like the sun, his clothes became dazzling white, and suddenly a bright, bright cloud overshadowed them. And then from the cloud, a voice says, This is my son, my beloved, who I'm well pleased. Listen to him. How did Peter, James, and John respond? Scared to death. When your best friend starts to glow, something's different. I'll, I'll, I'll tell on myself, uh, I am not a big uh, comic book person. Um, I, I love... I love listening to Jack and Stephen and other people talk about the Marvel and the DC universe. And folks, if, if you don't know the difference, don't ask me. Somebody's got Superman and somebody's got Iron Man. But I've become fascinated with one particular Marvel uh, movie that came out recently, and it's Captain Marvel. I, I find the old idea kind of fascinating. And if you haven't seen it, I'm not advocating you've seen it, but there's this one scene that just sticks with me where uh, Fury, who is played by Samuel Jackson, he's, he sees, he's introduced in a new way to the main character because she's literally aglow. She's, she's literally on fire practically. And his line is just so downplayed. He says, you're glowing. Well, what do you do when someone is glowing around you? You're petrified. You respond in terror. And Peter, James, and John, like fury, were petrified because the person they thought they knew was lit up like a torch. How do you respond in fear? Um, I put this in your notes. The book of Deuteronomy is, the, is, is Moses' last appeal to the Israelites before they cross into the promised land. It means second law because Moses is literally going through the story of all the crossing and he's kind of rehashing some of the details. And so he's retelling them, you know, what we did and what we remember. He gives them the Ten Commandments again as a reminder, but it's the end of the book. It's Deuteronomy chapter 31. Moses knows his life is about over. He's warning the people of God, the Israelites. God is going to take me. You're going to have a new leader, and you're going to go into the promised land, and you're going to be tempted to do all the wrong things. So, with that in mind, what do you think Moses would tell them? What should you say? Behave, obey, do the right thing, eat your food, listen to your mom and dad. Think of all the final instructions that you probably would want to give to your children maybe hours before you died. This is what Moses says. Assemble the people, men, women, and children, the foreigners residing in your midst, in your towns, so they can listen and learn to fear the Lord, your God. And follow carefully all the words of this law. Their children, in other words, the children of these children, the children of your children, your grandchildren, the ones who haven't heard this yet by me, by my words. He says, their children who do not know this law must hear it and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land you are crossing the Jordan to possess. His final words were, fear God. Now, you know, usually we, we talk about the significance of someone's final words, you know, the deathbed kind of confession or the deathbed kind of thing. And there's some awesome, awesome stories throughout Scripture where individuals had the privilege of being in those last moments in the presence of the, the patriarch of the family, and whether it was like Israel or Joshua or, you know, Joseph. And, and, and they give the final words before they pass. We always say those are important. Well, Moses says, fear the Lord. Fear the Lord. I think this is a message that we need to hear. It's not a message that we hear a lot of. And that's typically because, and I'm, I'm not trying to diss a lot of church leaders or whatnot, because I know why they do it. We, we tend, as ministers, to lean on the, the love of God's side, because that message is necessary, and it's... <sighs> It's easier. Uh, that's not completely true, but uh, you know, it's just, it's an easier kind of message to, to absorb. That God loves you, that God cares for you. And again, I'm not taking light of that because that's a message our world needs to hear again and again and again. But I believe we can't fully appreciate the love of God unless we've learned also the fear of God. 
You, I don't think you're going to sing Amazing Grace without understanding, without full understanding until you've glimpsed God's judgment. And, and why preach this? I, mean, I think, I think it's, it's, it's desperately needed in our country today. I think Americans have lost the fear of God. And because of that, David, in his life, there's a, a time when he, before he became king, where he was escaping from Saul. Some of you may remember the story where he's trying to get away from Saul constantly, and Saul's always trying to pierce him with a spear or a javelin, or, you know, he's chasing him down, all kinds of things. And at one point in time, David acts like he's crazy. He goes to another kingdom, and he acts like he's lost his mind, and he's just crazy. But as a result of that experience, he writes the 34th Psalm. And in the 34th Psalm, he makes this observation. This is starting in verse 7. It's in your notes. It's on the screen. He says, The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. And then he comes back to this idea, Fear the Lord, you his holy people. For those who fear him lack nothing. And then he uses kind of a metaphor, like the lions. You know, and they had lions in those days, folks. The lions may grow weak and hungry, the lines may not prosper, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, my children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. It's everywhere in the Bible. It's everywhere in the Bible. But what does it mean? What does it mean to fear God? Now, uh, I've had conversations with many of you over this topic, and I know that we all pretty much have an idea, and a, the right idea of, of what it means. But I, I came across a, a, an example I thought that was very profound, and it's a story some of you may remember. Some of you may have never read, but it's still a cool story. And this is about C.S. Lewis and his little seven-book fantasy for children called Narnia. And in that, he has a book called The Silver Chair, The Silver Chair. And he introduces a character by the name of Jill. And Jill is this young girl, and she's the main character of the story. And she goes on to have this tremendous relationship with the Jesus imagery. The Jesus is in, in the book is Aslan, the lion. And she has a great relationship with him. She learns to trust him. But before she can trust him, she needs first to experience to fear him. And in the opening kind of occasion where Jill is introduced to Aslan the lion, this is the scene. I'm going to read it for you. Kind of, kind of use your imagination a little bit. Just imagine a little girl meeting this huge lion for the first time. The lion says, are you not thirsty? She says, I'm dying of thirst. Then drink, said the lion. May I? Uh, could I? W would you mind going away while I do? In other words, Jill is scared to death over this lion. The lion answered this only by a look and a very low growl. And as Jill gazed at its motionless bulk, she realized that she might as well have asked the whole mountain to move aside for her convenience. The delicious rippling noise of the stream was driving her nearly frantic. She says, well, will you, will you promise not, not to do anything to me if I do come and drink? The lion said, I make no promise. Jill was so thirsty now that without noticing it, she had come a step nearer. So she said, do you eat girls? <laughs> and the lion said, I have swallowed up girls and boys, women and men, kings and emperors, cities and realms, said the lion. And it didn't say this as if it were boasting, nor as if it were sorry, nor as if it were angry. It just said it. Then she said, I, I daren't come. I, I daren't come and drink. And the lion says, well, then you'll die of thirst. Oh, dear, said Jill. Then the lion repeated, you'll die of thirst. Oh, dear. Coming another step nearer, I, I suppose I could go and look for another stream somewhere else. And the lion said, there is no other stream. That dynamic is the fear of God. Can he be trusted? Now, I, I know the, the correct answer is yes. But when you first meet him, I'm not so sure. Will he do the right thing? I hope so. I think there are three qualities, and most of us in this room can fill the blank in for at least two of these. So let me throw out the first one. The fear of God means at least these three things. The first one is it means the awe of God, the utter awe of God. And you'll notice, to be intellectual, 
emotionally, spiritually, and physically overwhelmed by the holiness, the power, the purity, the righteousness, the justice, the greatness, and the glory of God. The Bible says that no person can see God and live because God's awesomeness is so overwhelming. The power, and these, these are terrible analogies, in, but keep them in context, please. The terrible power of a, of a tsunami and the destructive force of that wave or the terrible power of a hurricane or a typhoon in the Pacific that can destroy and literally take thousands of people and, and do untold property damage. The sun in all its glory and its radiant heat, although right today I'd love to feel that radiant heat just a little bit more. Uh, you know, all that glory and grandeur of our sun or the awesome terror of a nuclear bomb. God has that in the snap of his finger. To fear God is it to be in complete and utter awe of what he is, what he's capable of, what he does. But that's not all. I think the word that many of you would use was the second one. It's also to have reverence for God. To fall down on one's face before God in homage and adoration and worship. Uh, let me take a, a little sidebar here today. I, I believe we live in what I'm going to call the OMG culture. The OMG. Oh my, and then you, I, I hear that so many times from well-meaning good people. And uh, especially in light of all the reality shows and the talent shows that we see, you know, you'll have some surprise ending or you'll have some performer that's just completely unexpected and everybody on the panel says, oh my, and, they'll, and, and they do that again and again and again. It strikes me as a symptom of how far our culture has gone from the fear of God. Uh, now, this is my opinion. But when you think about how high the Jews held God and the reverence of God and the highest esteem for God, that they would not even pronounce his name. You've heard this before, but let me remind you. Uh, when Moses was at the burning bush and he was trying to come up with as many excuses as he could as to why he shouldn't and couldn't and wouldn't go to Egypt and release God's people from captivity, he, one of his excuses is, well, who am I going to tell them is sending me? What's your name? And that's when God gives us his name. It's the verb to be. And a lot has been said about this, and I can't do justice in just a few moments. But in the Hebrew, it's four consonants. It's the letter Y, it's the letter H, it's the letter W, and it's another letter H. Those four consonants. Um, because in Hebrew, they did not add the vowel information until hundreds of years later after the writing. And so all they had in the text was the consonants, and they learned to naturally include what vowel pointings they needed to do and what combinations they needed to do. But again, they were so in awe of God, they forgot how to pronounce his name. So today, anytime a good Jewish scholar or any Christian scholar is reading Hebrew texts and they come to those four consonants, the letter Y, the letter H, the letter W, and the letter H, they know to insert the vowel pointings for the word Adonai. And they say Adonai, which means my Lord. And that's why today, depending upon what translation you read, some Old Testament books use the word Yahweh, Y-A-H-W-E-H, -E and some translations use Jehovah, J-E-H-O-V-E-H, -E I mean Jehovah, or A-H, as the proper name of God. And we, the point is we don't know. But it is a reflection of that sacred name that they don't pronounce. In our culture, we pronounce the letters G-O-D and have absolutely no idea of the glory, the judgment, and of the love of the one about whom we speak. Now, awe and reverence, I think those are the bank shots that everyone in this room would say if I ask you, what does the fear of God mean to you? What does the fear of God mean to you? Reverence, of course, awe, of course. It's the third one that I want to add that I think kind of adds the extra oomph to this conversation. Because, and this is the one we neglect, the fear of God includes the fear of dishonoring or disappointing your Father in heaven. 
It's not just the awe of God. It's not just the reverence for God, but it's the actual idea of I don't want to dishonor God. I don't want to disappoint God. So let me, let me tell another story about myself. When I was a kid growing up, I've told you many times I went to church. My father was an elder. We had two elders at the time, and the other elder, his name was Mr. McCullough. I, I don't even remember Mr. McCullough's first name. That's, we called him Mr. McCullough. But he had three sons, and his oldest son, Mike, was one of my good friends at church. You had church friends, and you had school friends, you had neighborhood friends, because we lived across town, and so Mike and I didn't go to the same school system, but we were friends at church. And so Mike was, you know, he was my go-to guy, and his dad was an elder, and my dad was an elder, so we had a lot in common. Mike had two other brothers, Greg and Doug, and the four of us together, we were a terror. <laughs> Those people still are amazed that I became a minister, but that's that's a story for another day. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> when I had the opportunity to spend the night at Mike's house, and we did that a lot, especially during the summer, his parents did something that just absolutely baffled me. I never saw his mom and dad yell at his boys, their boys. I never saw them discipline like a spanking. They never had to. And these were some crazy kids. But every morning as those boys would get ready to leave to go to school, or they'd get ready to go outside and to play, or they'd be ready to go to church, or whatever it is, they'd have breakfast together. They always had breakfast together. And mom and dad would say the same thing. they say, now remember, boys, don't dishonor your name today. Don't dishonor your name. Now, as a kid growing up, I thought that was the biggest scam I'd ever seen. Who cares, you know, let's go out and have fun. What's a name? But Mr. McCullough was a, you know, he was a, an operator in the community. He was a self-employed businessman, and he realized that one of the greatest gifts that God had given him was the integrity of doing work and maintaining a great name, and he taught that to his boys. And so his three sons today, they honor that name because that name means something in the community in which I grew up. Now, take that story and apply it to this one. And I don't know if this story is real. It's probably apocrypha, but back in the days when Alexander the Great was running rampant in the known world. He was actually capturing everything, every city, every nation. He was one of the most amazing military leaders. He had this amazing army. They were Greeks, and they were an amazing army, Macedonians and Greeks, and they just overran the, the known world. But he only had a few laws with his men in the military, and one of the laws, you could guess, was no one can desert. If in the heat of the battle you run away, and we catch you, you're dead. So if the enemy doesn't get you, we'll get you. So don't run. Don't desert. And as the story goes, on one occasional battle, it was really bad, and a young man panicked, and he ran from his post, and he flee. And they caught him. And so they brought this young man before Alexander the Great. And everyone in the battle, everyone in the army, everyone knew what the, the outcome would be. This young man was going to have his life forfeit. He was going to die. So he goes up there, and Alexander the Great says, What's your name, boy? What's your name? And the boy says, I was named after you, Alexander. And Alexander the Great did something, according to the story, that he had never done before. He stopped, he looked, and he said, turn him loose. And then he turns to the young man and he gave him this information. He says, boy, either change your name or change your behavior. And that's what I've learned. When it comes to fearing God, it's not just simply a matter of fearing in respect or fearing in reverence. A person who understands the fear of God doesn't want to let God down. We don't want to disappoint our Father. We don't want God to look bad. Um, I, there's a, a program called Peace Treaty that I used to use back in the 90s when I was going homes and I was talking about faith and I was trying to lead a couple or an individual to, to Jesus Christ. And there's a story in there about how, you know, and this is the illustration they use. Let's say you're trying out for a basketball team, you know, and you've, that, let's say that for your, your high school basketball team, they're taking 18 positions and you're competing against 30 boys. And so your goal is to look as good as you can. You want to beat out as many as you can so you can be a part of that 18 crew. But let's say you go through the tryouts and you succeed. Then your motivation changes. It's no longer to make me look good. I want to make my team look good and I want to make my coach look good. When we become Jesus followers, it's not just a matter of being afraid that God is going to punish us. The goal from this point on is now I want to make my coach, I want to make my master, I want to make my Lord look good. One Episcopal writer said, to fear God is to stand in awe of God. To be afraid of God is to run away from God. 
See the difference? They're very close. But they're different. And sometimes churches, church families, movements will emphasize the frightening aspects of God because they want people to be afraid of God, to be deathly afraid of God. And what happens so often when we create that kind of environment is it produces an unhealthy kind of fear and a slavish fear of a punishing master. And that's why I put in your sermon notes in Romans chapter 8, it's contrary to what the Apostle Paul describes. He says, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought you about your adoption to sonship. And by that adoption, we're able to cry out, Father! Because we want Father to look good. It's the same thing that John meant in 1 John chapter 4. He says, love is made complete among us so that we may have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love. Perfect love drives out fear. Now, the fear they're talking about is the fear of being punished, of being whipped, of being disciplined. The psalmist in Psalm 147, 11 kind of balances this together. He says, the Lord delights in those who fear Him who put their hope in His unfailing love. Now, folks, fearing God is not something that you just start doing right away. It's a process. And I want to admit, we're all in this process together. And so, I, I, I don't... You're going to take different parts of this, and it's going to apply to your life in different ways. We are all works in progress, but I firmly believe this is one of the most important lessons that we can have in the 21st century today, is learning to respect God, to learning to awe God, and learning not to disappoint God, to fear Him. And so I was thinking, I want to share with you as we wrap things up this morning, six simple things that might help you. They certainly help me to develop the right kind of fear, the kind of respect, the kind of reverence and awe for God. Okay? And you can write down what's beneficial to you because some of these you've done already and these are kind of like bank shots in basketball. But let me just share them anyway. The first thing is, and this is pretty strange really if you think about it, but if you're going to develop a fear of God, that fear comes from God. You need to ask God to teach you to fear Him. You need to ask God to teach you to fear Him. Now, again, I know that sounds strange. Uh, but I've discovered in my walk that the individual, the person who has not made Jesus the Lord of their life yet, they don't necessarily have a sense of respect or fear of God. Take the number of movies that we're being exposed to in television shows year after year after year. And if there is a religious aspect of that, you can tell it's almost always a sarcastic, you know, kind of bent. And where they, they talk about, if God's mad at me, He should strike me down. And of course, God doesn't strike people down. And so, over the course of the, of the environment and the culture, people have started to take God less and less and less seriously. And that's only because of His great love. He tarries. But one day, one day, I think for us as Christians in this context, the thing I would encourage you to consider, I, I don't have this down on your notes, I just thought of this. Um, if you're a Jesus follower, you need to demonstrate that you know something of the glory, something of the judgment, something of the love of God. So whenever you speak the name of God, whenever you speak the name of Jesus or the name of Jesus Christ, you need to speak that name in a way that demonstrates that you know Him. And it's not just an expression of startlement. It's not just an expression of, you know, it's not just a simple expression with no thought attached to it. You know, when, when, when God said and He told Moses to tell the Israelites, don't take my name in vain, you know, we, we often take that idea to the, I, the, the concept of, you know, God doesn't want to take His name in, in vulgarity, you know, something that He's darning or, you know, like, uh, that, that's not what it means. It means to t make it ordinary. It means to take the religious significance out of the Word. And so oftentimes I think some of the biggest culprits of doing that are ministers because we throw the name of God around like it was candy. And, and yet the point being is don't use that name except when you're serious about that name. So, ask God to teach you to fear Him. The second thing I want you to do if you want to develop this fear is to reflect upon God's character, the character of God. Reflect upon the character of God. Um, A.W. Towser, a great American preacher, 
one pastor, the 20th century, he made this bold statement. He says, people tend to move toward their mental image of God. Now let me say that again. People tend to move toward their mental image of God. If your mental image of God is he's this old guy upstairs and he's just an old grandfather, you know, and he kind of winks at sin, then that's kind of your response to who God is. Or if you see God as a demanding, vengeful, wrath-filled, you know, God waiting to, to, for you to make a mistake so he can damn you to hell, uh, most likely that's a God you're not going to want to associate with. But if you see God as generous as forgiving, as loving, as gracious. That's a God you can move towards. You need, you should reflect upon the character of God. What characteristics are that make up His person? Okay, the third thing is, and this is a rather strange one, is I encourage you to read and study the lives of the saints. And I mean saints in that sense of those men and women, those Jesus followers. Maybe they were martyred. Maybe they have lived in years past. These are the great men of Scripture. These are the great men and women of Scripture, the men of God, you know, those kinds of individuals who down through the ages have learned how to fear God. I think it's a great way, it's a good idea that occasionally, you may not like to read, but if you can listen to it on tape or whatever, is examine the biographies of great men and women. And if you're really afraid of listening to that, listen to some of the great men and women of our political history. Uh, it's amazing the religious background so many of these early, our forefathers established and had. But I would encourage you to do that. Uh, I gave you some suggestions of Wesley and Whitefield and Augustine, and, and you could just go on and on and on. That list is endless. But find some people that you can look at historically, Read about, examine their lives through biographies. Fourth thing is, don't forget, if you want to learn to fear God, open your eyes to the creation. I was talking to a friend of mine, and I told him my goal was to preach this sermon on the fear of God. And he says, let me tell you what I do. And so I wrote down what he said. He's, this is amazing. He says, I have a goal to get out in God's creation every day, even if it's for a few minutes. And today it's literally for a few minutes. To get out and to meditate on and to savor the mighty creation of God because He will teach you about His grandeur, His greatness. And also there will be some respect and some fear. So, I know we have some walkers and some runners in the group. And that's great. Take care of yourself. But in the process, enjoy the environment you're running and walking in, if you can. Because God's creation is amazing. Amazing. So, Understand the fear of God. Open your eyes to creation. The fifth one, this is simple, worship God. Worship God. Um, I, I, I could spend all day on this. I'm just going to skip. You need to worship God. As, as, a, as a minister, I would encourage you, and it's not because, and, 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 and those watching at home, it, it's so easy to skip this part of our life. Especially in light of a pandemic, you know, things going on. I get busy. Things get caught up. I got to take this. I need some rest. I, you know, I need to have some chill time or whatever the excuse might be. Don't neglect the worship of God in your life, whether it's personal worship at home with a daily quiet time and some devotions, whether it's corporate worship together in the body of Christ when you can watch it or when you're here. Don't neglect that. Because it's in that moment where you meet God and God meets you that you learn just how wonderful He is. And you learn to respect Him. And finally, this one's to parents and grandparents. Um, teach your children, teach your grandchildren to fear the Lord. And I'll tell you, I think one of the easiest ways to do that, in my opinion, and Lola was really good about this as our children were growing up, read them Bible stories. Don't just read the fun ones. Read all the Bible stories. There are some scary stories. Jack, if I can pick on you for a moment. I remember Jack was fascinated when he was younger about the plagues and what Pharaoh went up against with Moses and the plagues. Read all the stories. Some of those stories are kind of frightening, but there's a purpose for them because we learn that if you don't do what God wants you to do, there's consequences to behavior, just like there's consequences to not obeying mom and dad or grandma and grandpa. Read all the Bible stories. Read them a lot because kids do two things. They like stories and they like being with you. And so it's a win-win. When my son Eric was growing up, uh, you know, he was the boy of the family. And uh, his dad, uh, we would wrestle in the living room. We'd clown around and Lola would be not too happy all the time. But we would just, 
you know, it's a kind of the fun thing that dads do. I tried to wrestle with my girls, but it just wasn't the same. My son, it was fun. And I tried to teach him trash talk. I'm not that good at it. It was evident one day when he says, Dad, I'm going to clean your watch. No, you mean clock, son. You're going to clean my clock. But we did this stuff back and forth, and we'd have fun. And it's amazing. At any point when he was younger, it's not true today, but when he was younger, I could have snapped that little kid in half. I mean, I really could have just messed him up. But yeah, Lola would have killed me, and he was on my health insurance program, so I didn't know what to pay. But anyway, I could have done some damage, but it was amazing to me. I remember having this conversation with him when he was a little older, and I said, why didn't you think he was going to do it? And he says, Dad, I just trusted you. And I thought to myself, I will limit my power because he's my son. Now, some of you face some terrible things, and whether it's a pandemic, or it's work-related, or it's family-related, there are some scary things out there. And then we start getting into the health things. I just want you to know that all your enemies combined have limited power. Jesus was talking to his apostles on occasion. He says, don't fear the one who can kill you. I'm thinking that. I'm scared right there. Feel the one, scare the one, be afraid of the one who can take your soul and damn you to hell. Now, God's not going to do that if you'll trust him. He limits the power of any enemy on this planet because of his love for you. So I'm going to ask Marilyn to come up to the piano. And we're going to uh, prepare for communion and the closing of our service together. For those of you at home, I hope you have access to the communion supplies. Um, <clears throat> the song that I chose for communion today, I misspoke. I, I, I think I told you that... Um, um, what was the last song we sang? Great is thy faithfulness. That's, that's not known as the Crusader's hymn. The song we're going to sing now is the Crusader's hymn. We're not sure of the author of this song. Uh, this song goes way, way back. There was actually a group of Christian kind of separatists. They're called the Hus, H-U-S. And we believe the song originated out of them because they were trying to live a very Christian life. As a matter of fact, if you want to read about saints and some interesting historical things, there are some good people to read about. But they loved music. And so they wrote and sang a lot of the musics. And it's believed that this song comes from their history. This is the one that's called the Crusaders hymn. Like I said, even though it was written much later than that. But it, it expresses the praise of God. It expresses the grandeur of God, specifically through His Son, Jesus Christ. So we're going to sing together, Fairest Lord Jesus. If you have access to a hymnal, it's hymn number 87, and we're going to sing the fourth, the first and the fourth stanza. Fairest Lord Jesus, ruler of nature, O Thou of God and man, the Son, the Savior, Lord of the nations, Son of God and Son of Man, glory and honor, praise, adoration now and forevermore be Beautiful Savior, Lord of the nations, Son of God and Son of Man, glory and honor, praise, adoration, now and forevermore be thine. As you leave this morning, take your communion supplies with you and partake here or on your road or wherever you may be. And don't forget, to fear God is not just to be in awe of Him, 
It's not just to reverence him, but it's also, I just don't want to disappoint him. I don't want to displease him. I don't want to make God look bad because of my life. Jesus paid the ultimate sacrifice for you and for me. Let's close with prayer. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the sacrifice, Jesus, that you made. As we have an opportunity as a church family for a moment to set aside all the stuff that's going on in our world and just reflect upon what you've done, Jesus, we thank you. We know that the sacrifice you made, well, I, I can't begin to imagine what you experienced. But you did it for us. The Bible seems to indicate that there was a moment in time that for the first time in eternity, God the Son and God the Father were separate completely. And again, I don't know how it's possible. But God the Father turned His back on the Son because the Son, Jesus, you represented all the sin of the world. Help us to realize what a precious gift that we've been given. A relationship with the Creator of the universe because of what you did on the cross. And because of that, we can fear you in awe, in reverence, and we can do what we can never to displease you. And our relationship with you may have started with just downright fear of damnation and hell, but now I hope it's proved to be something more and better and richer than that. We're looking forward to the time when we get to reign with you for eternity. Until that day, until that time, I pray you find us faithful. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Next week, we're going to ask the question, what do you do when there's nothing you can do? Come back next week. You have a great week, folks.